Dean Lonigan. Welcome to Between Two Beers. Looking forward to this immensely with the export gold you've got there and the export ultra. Which is the better one? I'm an ultra guy. Shay's off the booze. I am. So, uh, Just over two years now. Yeah. So is it cold? These Over are cold, the, straight out of the fridge. You know what? You're going to go for a zero. I, I've got to have. I don't drink, so uh, I'm happy to have a zero. What a guy! Oh yeah, and, get in there, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Beautiful man, oh, love Excellent. it. We're very excited to have you in the Export Beer Garden Studio. We wanted to start. This Hang on, let's get it. Let's get it. Oh, no, that's actually really good. There you go. There you go. I tell you what, I do like is the um, is the DB Export Citrus. Yes, which, which is it's a zero beer again. <laughs> Some in the fridge, but it's like uh, it's, it tastes like the old sweats bit of lemon. Yep. I love the stuff, and yep. I got to say that's really good too for a zero. It's there all you go. Good. I love that, Dean. Yeah, yeah, I've never I've never seen that. We've never had that in 140 episodes. <laughs> Guests reach over and go, "Fuck, I'll have a bit of that." Actually, <laughs> brilliant. Hey, a strong start. Hey, um, we wanted to start by talking about Mia Motu because we've done. 140 episodes now and we often get asked what was your favorite and i always mention mia uh, her story was so powerful and captivating and inspirational uh, i wondered if you could just talk about what you've seen with her over the last i guess couple of months maybe since the last world title fight that she won and, and leading into the fight coming up she's a uh, remarkable young lady um the reason we signed her up was my son uh liam and he you know he he's got a much be- better understanding of boxing than i do I look at it from a promotional, I understand it a little bit, but he really gets into it. And he said, Dad, the way women's sports is going, we've got to get into this. And more importantly, I think Mia Motta is, is something quite special in terms of how she can fight. So we signed her up. And what turned out is that we got ourselves a lot, a tiger by the tail, in so much as she's a lot, she's got a very, very different story to tell. I think um, she tells it remarkably well. I think she's incredibly intelligent. And she, but she comes across very folksy and homesy, and she's just a downright good, really good person. She's got four, five kids, I think. One of them plays bowls for New Zealand. I think, from what I can understand, she's an exceptional mum. Uh, she's gone from her personal circumstances have changed since she was on Fight for Life. I think if you go back probably four, six, and I shouldn't, I don't know if I should say this or not, but she was probably on social welfare four, six months ago. Now, she's obviously got a boxing career ahead of her. She's doing speaking engagements, which you know she goes well out of. She's got jobs with two different uh, organisations. One's Mike King's I Am Hope, which she goes into schools and talks about the things that she talks about. And she's also with Build People, one of the sponsors of Fight for Life, who indeed and, and, and wanted to engage her. So her life, from what I can see, has changed immeasurably. And like all people who win world titles, and we've been through this with a guy called Jeff Horn and Jaya Bataya and Joseph Parker, when you get to that level, your life goes on fast forward because there's always so much happening, right? So mm-hmm. last week, you know, I had it suggested to me because we're going to take a fight up to Whangarei. We're working on the date for December 2 where we'll have a double world title fight with uh, Miyamoto uh, as the IBO Super Bantamweight champion and also Lani Daniels, who is another remarkable woman from um, up north, comes from Ngātiwai in Whangarei or around that region. So we're, we're looking to do a double header world title fight up there. And so I took Mia up to, uh, to her iwi, uh, way up north in Kaitaia. And, um, mate, we had a great... We drove home, which is it's about a four-and-a-half-hour drive. We had a good... She was remarkable in the meetings. You know, how she relates to people is just... It's fantastic. And we had a laugh and a giggle on the way home. And I got to spend a lot of time with her, get, get, get you know, a lot of understanding. Because when you're a promoter of a fighter, I don't sit down and chat with them every day. They do their stuff, I do mine, and the jobs are so radically different. So, uh, yes, we've, uh, I think in Mia, I think New Zealand, not just us as a boxing promoter, I think New Zealand sport has had uncovered an absolute nugget of gold in terms of commitment, dedication, focus, overcoming adversity. You, adversity, you boys have obviously got the story out of her, of her background. It's remarkably hard. It's remarkably different and difficult. But here she is with an amazing family. She's got a mum and a sister with her. They're just about to move into a brand new house, which you know is warm and dry. Mia's had problems over the last three, four, or five months because uh, she lives out west and the house was flooded. And as a result, where she lives downstairs, um, she keeps her place immaculately clean. But because of the floods, there's a whole lot of mold and stuff and spores, and she's been having asthma attacks, and she hasn't been that healthy. So she's moving into a new house and. She's got a whole lot of really good stuff happening that she so deserves to have. And, you know, it's just a privilege for us to be part of the journey because all we do really is lay the platform and, and potentially find opportunities for her 
that you know her her current coach and management are so busy helping manage her life and so busy um, so busy training her and, and and teaching her a whole lot of new stuff and there Alina and Isaac Peach are, are, are really incredible there. What's going on out in West Auckland in the Peach Boxing Gym is is remarkable, uh, not only from a sports performance point of view but a change lives point of view. And um, so yeah, so what they're doing with Mia is, is is quite incredible. So it's a privilege to be part of that. It was Liam's. Like I said, it was his idea to to sign her up, and as a result, here we are on an interesting and different journey that I never thought I'd be in when it comes to you know boxing promotion. Like we've uh, traditionally done it with the men. We've had Jeff Hall. Joe Parker was our first world champion, uh, WBO world heavyweight champ. Then we had Jeff Horn, who won his world title against Manny Pacquiao in front of fifty one thousand at SunCorp Stadium, and that was quite remarkable. Then we had Jai Abatia, who's a uh, a cruiserweight, uh, who had a remarkable win last year where he fought a guy called Maris Breedis, who's without doubt one of the toughest men in boxing, full stop. Breedis in round two broke Jai's jaw mm. on one side. Breedis in round 10 broke Jai's jaw on the other side. And Jai finished the fight walking forward, taking shots on his jaw, trying to knock this guy out. He's without doubt one of the toughest, if not the toughest man I've seen in my entire life. And I think he could do remarkable things. And then we go to, uh, to Mia, who's had this very um, hard background. And I've got to tell you, all boxers, regardless of who they are, they've all got a very different story to tell because it is not normal, in my opinion, to get into a boxing ring and try and dominate someone else physically as hard as you do. And I know in rugby league and rugby union and and sports such as that, um, there is a physicality to it. But, mate, it's nothing like boxing because you're actually in there trying to knock the other person out. And uh, so you've got to come with something special or something different that uh, that drives that. And... uh, and Mia in particular, she's had a very, very hard background. I don't know that she'd want to credit her background to how good she is and, and mentally tough as a boxer. I, 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 sp- I spoke to Isaac about that yep. a, uh, in the lead up to our last interview. Yep. And he said that he doesn't like when people credit what happened to her. I can understand he, that. He said that she would have just been a world title. She would have had a world title sooner if not yep. for that. And, and we had her on. And at the end of that episode... It was really overwhelming. Her story is yeah, so powerful. And I is. left that recording thinking she's going to be an absolute superstar. When more people hear that story, yes. like when that gets out and she keeps winning and their, her trajectory keeps rising, she is going to conquer this country. And then I was at the Fight for Life. So we recorded on the Tuesday and then I came to the ah. fight on the Friday night, I think it was. And the energy in that room when she walked out, it was like the emotion of every. It seemed like everyone was in that journey together. They knew what she'd been through. They knew how important this was to her. Yeah. And when she won, I looked around my table, and everyone had tears in their eyes. Everyone was seemed to be on this path together. It was mm. it was quite a remarkable scene. No, it is, and I think I, I think she is something to offer New Zealand society, way above mm. uh, what she does as a boxer. But that's up. That's her journey, and for her to work that out. And if she wants to share that journey going forward with the country, that's a wonderful thing. And if she chooses not to do it because she finds it too painful, well, that's entirely up to her. And the only person who can make the decision whether her history and past has led her to what she is today, that's for her to make that determination, and nobody else. You know, so it's just an interesting ride. You know, and then we've got the lovely Lani Daniels as well, who's the IBF World uh, Heavyweight Champion. And Lani, is a, in her own right, is someone quite remarkable. And I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something that I'm probably not supposed to say, right? But she was seconded at a very late notice about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago. We're about to announce our double header fight we've got coming up on uh, August 26th. Lani, I'm guessing, was a reserve for the British version of the SAS program. I don't know if you've seen oh, it. Oh, yeah. yeah right. But out of the blue, right, she gets dragged in at the last minute to participate in this thing that's been shot down in Queenstown. And I think it goes on Channel 5, which means it's going to have an audience of millions in the UK. And it's a free-to-air product. So Lani goes on it, and she's in there. She's one of 16, and there are all sorts of famous people out of the UK, and she probably doesn't know who they are. But she gets all the way through <laughs> to the last three, and that's like they don't have an absolute winner. But some of the stuff she told me what she had to go through and she didn't think anything of it. And all these other YouTubers oh, really? and famous people and athletes are all falling out left, right and centre. All these podcasters and, and all these other <laughs> and, and she's just, you know, mildly taken it on the chin. So I think in Lani too, we've got somebody quite remarkable. And strangely enough, she comes from up north. Uh, so so Nia, Mia's from the far north up in uh, yeah. Kaitaia and Lani's from uh, around Whangarei uh, or just out of Whangarei. So, um, yeah, it's a, um, 
it's it's just fascinating. You've got these bastions of excellence coming out of there, and so hence I'm keen to take them up there totally. at some stage, and hopefully we can get get all the deals done required to get done to go there. You know, because when you're running when you're running the company that we run, and you've got these events going on, you're bringing international opponents, and you've got to do national media. It's not cheap to do, so we just got to get everything together. But I think if we can package this up right, and if we can um, if we can get the media engaged, which I think we have particularly around MIA, but we've got to go further than that. I think these women have got something remarkable to offer this country. And, yep. and they are not, I promise you, and you've already found this out. You get rugby players on here, you get rugby league players, current ex, mate, they're sanitised nowadays. Once upon a time, the leagueies used to say shit that was really interesting and different and they'd have fun and laugh. And they still have fun and laugh. But to a large degree, because of the corporatization mm-hmm. of the sports, they don't say anything that interesting anymore. You know what I mean? That, that is me. The, the realness of You're not going to get Dan that. Carter come on and say how many, you know, the, ne- the, the evil things he used to do <laughs> when he was young. Because I'm sure he did, because yeah. everybody does. Yeah. But I've heard you talk, there's a strategy behind this, right? Y- you, you don't direct your, the, the boxers no. or fighters you work with with any media training. You, no. you just put them in the deep end and, and let them survive. I, I think the best way for people to get better in the media, forget about the media training, right? You'll have every man and his dog in media saying, oh, they've got to have training, they've got to have training. Bullshit. The best thing you can do is let them be authentic, throw them in the media, and they'll either sink or swim. They'll say some stupid shit along the way, and they'll say some really neat shit along the way, and that's what makes up. People buy into personalities. Like, if you're going to a sporting event, you know, in a perfect world, you feel like you've got a personal relationship. And the thing about boxing, as opposed to the FIFA World Cup that goes on currently, um, the Rugby World Cup that's coming up, you've got... Six, seven hundred people participating. That's six or seven hundred different names, and the only thing you can recognise really is the is the juices that take place. In boxing, there's one person or two people. That's it. And when you hear their stories, when you start to like them as a person, that's when the whole thing explodes because you get emotionally engaged. And the reason why the fight for life was so successful for so many years is that rather than have on the whole boxers that you didn't know fighting in the ring, you had a whole lot of guys or girls you knew. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you brought into their personality because you liked them or you don't like them, you want to get them beaten up or you don't want to see them beaten up, you know? And that's yeah. and that's what we have to do uh, as promoters is to get their personality. We lay the platform, it's up for them to embrace it. And the more famous they become, it's really simple. Media in this game equals money. And uh, mm. the more media they get, the more money they're going to get paid. If the woman can bring in more money, pay them more. Why not? Mm. That's how it should be. You mentioned Fight for Life. I'm keen to talk about that because it, it went away for a number of years when you moved to Australia. You've come back and it seemed like a big success the night I was at. Is that, are we back? Are we bringing back, yeah. back, back to an annual? Look, we, uh, Liam and myself went over. We ended up with a contract in Australia with Fox Sports and we had it, I think, for around seven years. And um, unfortunately, we lost it. And we've come back here. And I've got to tell you, I'm really enjoying being back at home because Australia is a very, it's a great place to have your mates. It's a very, very tough place to do business. And um, when you're away from home for a, a long period of time, you know, we went through COVID and all that sort of stuff, which, by the way, I didn't think was that much of a fucking big deal. You sat at home, you watched, I watched Game of Thrones in a, in a week. <laughs> you know what I mean? I enjoyed getting up every day watching Game yeah, of Thrones. And then, you know. Positives. And like all companies, you know, as it, we were given subsidies because nobody could work in the events industry, we just couldn't do anything. And um, so we were over there and we did our seven years, but I'm really enjoying being back at home. And when we come home, it was like, well, what do we do? Because we'd get ourselves up to be in Australia on an ongoing basis. And we had a couple of guys I think will end up being superstars in the world of boxing, one called Justice Hooney, who's a heavyweight, and uh, the other is a guy called Jaya Pattaya. Now, I'm unfortunately going through, uh, we unfortunately going through a court battle with Jai because he had, uh, we spent an enormous amount of money to get him to where he got to, laid the platform, lost a huge amount of money on his world title fight with a year and a half left on his contract, decided, oh, I'll just go somewhere else. Well, unfortunately, son, that's not how it works. He's got, un- he's got incredibly bad advice from his management who I think are complete cocksuckers, but that's just how it works. Jai's actually a lovely young man who's been led astray. But these are the things... I don't want to do this stuff. I just want to get on and promote the sport and, and have fun doing what we're doing. But it's been a huge learning curve for me and been bitten in the ass a couple of times in Australia by uh, what I would consider. They display on a regular basis, in my opinion. These guys mainly made it sometimes out of New South Wales. They display their criminal backgrounds on a regular basis, whereas we were brought up over here and <laughs> propagated by Presbyterian ministers 
and I think we go over there with um, we go over there with our eyes wide open and think this is the big time, and away we go. When actually it's a very very tough market. They're very brutal in the way they do business. I think they're harder in New South Wales, particularly than anywhere else. It's, it's just it's a fascinating place to go and do business. And I've spoken to people who are literally billionaires, right? And they talk about Australia being the hardest. They'll do business in America, they'll do business in China, they'll do business in the UK, but they'll talk about Australia as being the hardest place to do business. Yeah. So, um, What lessons did you learn from Australia then that you've brought back here to New Zealand? Um, the, cultures, the business culture, in my opinion, is very different. Queenslanders, in my opinion, are very close to what we are. Uh, whereas New South Wales is a lot harder, a lot more cutthroat, you know. Um, and what, what, what have I learnt? I'm not quite sure yet. All I know is that the, the big learning is that it's a lot, it's hard to replace a lifetime of where you live. So when we're in Australia, you're up against people who are your competitors who have been there all their lives, and those roots go deep with everybody that they deal with because they all know somebody from school days or they've grown up in rugby league with them. Whereas in New Zealand, I've got the same advantage here. You know, like I've got, I know guys in positions of power now because as you get older, that's what they, less positions of power, senior positions. And, and you know them, they know you, and it's a lot easier to go and cut deals and just reconnecting with that base. Um, you know, it's just taking me time and it's taking me time to, to get my head around coming back home and doing things differently. You know, and that's it. and that's all just part of the journey. And I got to tell you, I'm really enjoying it. And the, and the absolute highlight is to be doing it with my son Liam. He's incredibly intelligent and thinks deeply about a whole lot of stuff. So, uh, as a dad, mate, how good does it get? You get to see a young fella every day. Liam's been in our ear. We we often go to family and friends to get a few lines on our. Yeah. So he's given us a few bits we're going to get to uh, soon. I wanted to pick up, I mean, you've, you've had such an incredibly vast career of promoting different things and different jobs, but I wondered if we could pick up uh, Fight of the Century Tour versus Cameron. The fight had been organised and you get bought in to do the promotions for it. Now, in the whatever it is, 30 years since, has there been a better pre-fight build-up than when David Tour was on Holmes and he sort of said, oh, I'm really going to no, hurt you. <laughs> that was as good as it got. And, and, and I'll tell you who was the, uh, the genius behind that was the current chairman of the Warriors, Kenny Rainsfield. Really? So Kenny was the manager trainer of Shane Cameron yeah. and, and promoter at times. And Kenny did an outstanding job with Shane, you know, uh, to get him to where he got him to. And the build up and the zenith of that was Tua versus Cameron. And, um, but David on TV, it was Kenny who said outrageous things along the way I at remember, press conferences. I remember like he had a little he had a little light on his on a, a skull on top of a pen that was a light and he said, David Tour, it's gonna to be lights That's out. Right. And I remember <laughs> looking at it going, Kitty, you've just blown this thing through the roof. And then and when David I think it was on Paul Holmes, he I remember him sort of clicking his neck on both sides and you could tell he was so angry. Because in all the time that he'd been bo- a boxer, because he was enormously respected enormously respected in America and he'd spent most of his career over there but to come home and to put up with this you know from uh, what he would have seen as mm. not on his level and he, he showed it and uh, I, I think one of the great tragedies of New Zealand sport and boxing is that David Tua never got to fight Mike Tyson or Evander Holyfield How do you Tua think he Tyson would have yeah, gone? Fight? I think he destroys both of them Really? And the reason I say that is that one he hit as hard as anyone's ever hit in the heavyweight division and two, both those guys would have stood in front of him and fought, right? Tyson would come forward bobbing and weaving, which made him hard to hit. But David Tua was just a, just a beast. An absolute, and I think he is so underrated. And I've had this conversation with people, and they all jump up and down and go, no, he wouldn't, no, he wouldn't, because they don't understand, in my opinion, how good he was in his prime. Mm. And he was an absolute beast. And had he have fought Tyson and had he have fought Holyfield he would have gone down as one of the all-time greats because, in my opinion, he knocks them both out because they actually stand there and fight. And that's the worst thing you could do with David Tua, a.k.a. Shane Cameron. Yeah, because he fought Lennox Lewis, but he sort of got held at arm's Lennox length, Lennox Lewis he? is one of the all-time great boxers, you know, yeah. like, and it's six foot six. Yeah. I went and saw that fight in Vegas, right? So there's Tua versus Lewis, and I went and saw Lewis uh, the day before or two days before in the actual boxing ring in the arena. And they were uh, stretching him out where they pulled his arms back behind his back. 
I have never seen anyone with yeah. arms as long as that. It was like an albatross. <laughs> and it was like Lewis was a superb boxer who at times he knew he had a suspect chin and all he did was keep David at bay and David couldn't get in. And there's an old adage that styles make fights, right? And that, unfortunately, it wasn't a great fight. It wasn't a great fight for David Tua. But had he fought those other two, but that's just, and I'm sure with the benefit of time and, and hindsight, it's a wonderful thing because it's 2020 vision. They'd go back and they'd fight Tua, sorry, they'd fight whole, you know, Tyson. And I think the reason they didn't want to fight Tyson is Tyson knew, and also I don't think Kev Barry at the time got on so well with Tyson's manager, Shelley Finkel. And then on the flip side of the coin, Kev used, they used, David used to be promoted by Duva Promotions. And Holyfield was promoted by Duva Promotions. The second David left Duva and went to Gerson or America Presents, the decision was made, well, Tua never gets to fight Holyfield. That's, the, that's that, done. That's the part of the game that nobody outside of the game really understands, is it? Is the, well, the horse the, trading and how that works. Because if you're in the same camp, if you're in the same with the Duvers with Holyfield and Tua, it doesn't matter. You win either way. Right, so if you've got the promotional contract on both guys, and Holyfield went on to fight Tyson, imagine if after Holyfield had beaten Tyson, next up was Tua, and if you're the goose in camp, you go, I want that fight to happen because whoever wins, we win. Mm. It's not rocket science, but it just with a benefit. I'm sure things would would pan out differently with everyone had the benefit of hindsight, and it's just a wait. How does uh, Peak Tua go against Peak Joseph Parker? Yeah, that's the comparison to make now. Oh, isn't I, it? I, I, I'm not going to make a comment on that. <laughs> uh, we, I was asked that many, many years ago, and I said, you know, why would you put two good-looking South Auckland boys in the ring together? No, <laughs> I, I, I think that would be an incredible fight, but I, I don't have an opinion either way because they're both very different, yeah. and they're both great people. Would that fight. stylistically would that make a good fight? Joseph is not scared to engage, right? And he likes to fight, and he likes people who come forward. He doesn't run away, so I think it would be a bloody war, to be honest. I think it would be a great fight, and Joe's got an incredible chin, as does David Tua. So um, I have no idea how that would go, but I, I think it would be an exciting fight. Before we move on, can I just loop back to mm -hmm. Fight for Life for a second and pick away at a niche area, which is when you fought my former PE teacher, Buck <laughs> Anderson. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Buck was a good guy. He was yeah, my he, PE he's still teacher a good too. guy. Yeah, he's yeah, a great both of our PE teachers. Yeah. Boys Stylistically, I can't exactly remember how that fight went down, but how was <laughs> well, that experience? The, it was interesting because when you are uh, when you're uh, promoting, right? Oh, at that stage, I hadn't run too many boxing events, right? So I'd helped Kevin Barry put on a David Tua fight in the early '90s, I think it was, and. It came about, how did it come about? Oh, that's right. A mate of mine's house burnt down. Peter Spear used to work at NZME back in, in a different alliteration. He was a um, he was a sales rep. And he had no insurance on his house. So I got together a few mates and we put together a, a fight night where me and my league mates fought. Spiro fought on it as well. We raised him about 50 grand to go and build himself a new house. And, mate, I was floating on air, you know, like it's one of the best things I've ever done. And... Then uh, there was a charity guy there, a guy called Marko Marinkovic, who was heading up Yellow Ribbon. He says, mate, would you do one of these for us? And I thought about it. I says, yeah, we'll do that. And the idea was that we would, uh, we would get some high-profile rugby league guys, high-profile rugby union guys, put them in the ring and try and raise a million bucks. And uh, I know we put it together pretty quickly. And guys like, I think it was Warren Gat was it, uh, Gatlin. Oh, it wasn't Gatlin. I can't remember. Jeez, my memory's not so good. But I remember talking to Buck Anderson about it. And, uh, you know, and I've read media articles where Buck talks about it, where I'm on the phone talking to the million miles an hour and I'm, he managed to understand fight and this date and charity. He said, yeah, sweet, I'm in. <laughs> so, uh, and mate, Buck was an incredibly nice guy and I've, I've met him a few times yeah. uh, since then. And I, I, I look back and I'm not very happy with the way I carried on at times because, you know, I was given a bit of a gobful at the start and that's not really what this whole thing was about. And, mate, we had legends on there. We had Mark Graham and Buck Shelford, for God's sake. Yeah. And we also had... Uh, Mel had Meninga was, was on Party. the Mel Meninga a good mate of mine from years gone by. Um, it was Mark Bourneville and Steve McDowell Mark, yeah, was yeah. the one that I remember. And Bourneville just came out. Yeah, well, <laughs> horse... Throwing. <laughs> horse. Horse. Yeah. Horse, <laughs> horse was always mad as a cut snake, and he loved doing that stuff. And uh, I remember John Ackland, who coached yeah. uh, uh, the Warriors at it for a while uh, as assistant coach. He said, Dino... Because rugby union and rugby league, we'd always been viewed as a, as a second-class citizen. And that's changed now because of the way the Warriors and the NRL go. 
But Ackland said to me, uh, Dino, this is a great idea, but don't fucking lose. So for us leaguers, it was actually quite a big yeah, deal, right. you know. I remember Steve McDowell was like a judo champ or something yeah. like that as well, and yeah. Bourneville just fucked, flew out and was just throwing him. Yeah, no, horse was always mad. Mal was sensational, you know. He up against Kevin Borovich, um, you know. So yeah, it was a, look, it was a lot of fun back then. I think the first time round we raised about half a million bucks for the Yellow Ribbon Charity, and then, uh, but it, it was really interesting because. Uh, I didn't get the same buzz out of that because we didn't hit the million dollars that I got out of doing one for me mate, you know. Mm. But the one I did for me mate, it's like, it was just an incredible feeling. You know, you walk for, for a month, you're walking around on air. It was just, uh, it was just awesome and a lot of fun. What is know? it about fight sports that attracts fundraising activities? I don't know. Like, I think, um, I think after the Fight for Life, because it was on free-to-air TV, a lot of people thought, oh, that's a good idea. And they run quite a few of them and it's become quite a staple of New Zealand fundraising for quite some fighting time. And, and fighting and laughing is it Red Nose Day or Fight for Life are the two things that seem to raise the most money yeah yeah well, extremes look, it's not uh, but then again you've got the genius of Mike King has come through and who would have thought you could make five or six million dollars off wearing gumboots yeah. yeah you know what Mike's done is uh, incredible so I think that's far surpassed anything we ever did with Fight for Life and um He's got, yeah, Mike, Mike's doing God's work out there. and he, Actually, Mia Motu has uh, hooked up with Mike's charity and she's now presenting in schools on behalf oh, of brilliant. I Am Hope, which is fantastic. Yeah. But, yeah, I can't speak highly enough of the work that Mike's done and what he's managed to achieve. You know, I, I remember years back, him and his mates went out to a bloody uh, cage. Remember we pigs in cages? They were releasing pigs in cages years and years ago, you know. So Mike's had this... Uh, community thing going on for some time and, and what he's managed to achieve and the sheer amount of money he has to raise to keep this thing going and I think he's actually doing something significant because fundamentally what they do with I Am Hope is to get enough money to give to psychologists to get kids from the age I think of 15 through to 25 to get in and talk about their problems and that's the single best thing I think you can do for the mental health of people is to put them in front of someone trusted, someone experienced and you can talk about your problems you know and, and for a lot of people that's very very hard to do so mike's doing great work yeah, how is. we got to mike king i don't know but yeah, we did. yeah yeah and by the way mike was at the very first fight night that we had with uh my mate peter spear he was ring him and martin devlin were ringside and we oh. had a you know the, the association and he went to the same high school i went to massey high, massey high yeah. yeah so the association's been there for a very long time and just it's amazing how people cross over in your life yeah, I, I want to start charting the path. Um, I'm going to take us in a slightly different direction. We're going to talk about rugby league and stuff later. But I want to g hone in on mid-20s, Dean, because it seems you were running a pretty interesting operation. You are doing breakfast radio at Hodaki. You had a stint doing sponsorship and marketing with the Warriors. You are running events on the side. Like, quite a lot for a sort of a 26-year-old. But I wanted to start talking about the Morning Pirates. How did you get involved into the media scene? It was just luck, you know, like... Um The CEO of Radio Howrick, he was a bit of a league fan, a guy called Dan Boyle. And the Kiwis, like they, Radio Howrick had had me on a couple of times because a lot of the Kiwis were playing overseas. I was one of the few playing at home. And I got involved in an incident where I got knocked out in a test match in 91 down in Melbourne. And it became, at that time, the media scene was a lot different. We had like 25% of New Zealand watching that on TV3 mm. at the time. I remember. I watched it myself live. Yeah, Clayton Friend, what a game. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we won. Uh, we beat the Australians for the first time in a long time. I got knocked out. And for whatever reason, I, I can't remember, there's a thing called the Morning Pirates where you had uh, Phil Gifford, Mark Perry, and I think Susie. And Susie and Mark Perry, uh, Susie and Phil Gifford got poached to go down to Christchurch. And, there was, and this is just after this had happened. And they brought me in for a week. And a week turned into a month. A month turned into six years. Realised you had the gift of the gab? Well, I don't know if I did or I didn't, but... Uh, the one thing I can promise you, and you guys would know this, right? Whether you're right or wrong when it comes to things in the media, particularly in live media where you're on TV or radio, just speak with great authority. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a minimum, half the people will believe you and half the people will get inflamed. And if you say it well enough and you explain yourself, you've got 80% on your side. It's not rocket science. Do you get any broadcast standing complaints against anything that the Morning Pirates did across that six years? No. Good. From memory? Yeah. No. Because, you know, there's boundaries. But I used to. You know, I used to make major fuck-ups along the way. Like, I remember um, one, of the, one of the things we did, because I hadn't read anything out loud 
for years and years and years. So I had to read like a traffic report and I stumbled and bumbled my way through it, you know, and for the next week on air, the bloody producer, a guy called Tom Davis, who unfortunately has died now, he brought me in a book, The Cat in the Hat. And I, had, <laughs> I had to read The Cat in the Hat live yes. on air. But we did, we did some cool shit. Like, um, funny you say that. Sorry, we went to Leah Panapa and we asked. Ah, the oh, lovely pineapple. We, we, we asked what. She tried to get me sacked for the first three years we worked together. She fucking hated me. <laughs> Honest truth. Really? I always, I always had time for Leah. Yeah. But then we slowly got to be mates and now we're great I, friends. I, wish and we I could really bring, love Leah. Yeah. I wish we could bring her actual voice into it, but Stephen's going to read a, a quote from I, her it, that it, we got it in preparation. It was pretty much what you just said. He said uh, she said, when we started working together on Hodak in the early mid 90s his reading sport was horrible he said he had recently <laughs> finished playing footy so you know i believe he was reading dr seuss books to himself at night to bring his reading up to his power ask him which books he read and i thought that was a joke i thought <laughs> no. oh yeah it's just like having a bit of a go but it was reading no, tom, genuinely da- tom, working. tom davidson made me read, read them on air <laughs> <laughs> but you know it was all part of the uh it was all part of the having some fun and it was look. It was a fa- after I got knocked out. Right. It was a fascinating time because we went to um, we went to a live cricket game with my good mate Mike Regal, who was a program director, and he now owns a radio station down in Wanaka. And I still talk to Reg once a week for the grand sum of nothing to uh, to give my opinions on sport for the week. It's called Lonigan on the Loose, and that's what we used to call the shit back in the days when we were at Harrogate. But I remember going to uh, we went to a uh, a one day at Eden Park, and there's like thirty. 35,000 people there. Radio back then was very different to now because it was very, there was nowhere near as much media as you have now, right? And I can remember going out to try and buy a beer. And, mate, I'm, this is no bullshit. I had hundreds of people fucking bowing to me. It's interesting you say that for the first three years, Leah wanted you sacked because I'll, I'll just introduce the second part of the quote and we'll leave Leah, <laughs> Leah part of it behind. No, no, you can talk about yeah. Leah as much as you want well, she said I the, love it, it is. She said the same thing and here, and here it goes. Him and I would be each other's wingman and woman when we went out. It worked so well that we both had the same woman interested in us in a ball run by Radio Hodaki. He won in the end. But all shen- shenanigans aside, Dean Lonigan is one of the best blokes I know. He's loyal to the end, a bloody wonderful caring friend who loves his family and son, his mates. He still keeps in touch with many of his school friends and is someone I would be in the trenches with and hide behind. Oh. Well, that's a bit harsh. That's, like, that's, <laughs> that's quite emotional. There's another she's bit, such a good girl. She is. And just, to clarif- just for a clarification from her, oh, and I wasn't trying for that woman at the ball. Just to be clear, <laughs> she went both ways, and I panicked and left the party. Uh, that's quite funny. Yeah, she's True story? Bro- um, I hope Liam's not listening, but yeah. <laughs> Very good. Very good. It was a long time ago. She's a wonderful woman, Liam Parnipa. She is a wonderful woman. Must have been some great times over those six years. Um, yeah. And look, I've been fortunate enough to keep in contact with her and... We caught up down at Waiheke Island with a husband who is such a good bloke as well, and he is a very special man to put up with the lovely Leah Parnipa. But um, yeah, no, she's a really good girl, and we've you know we've had a good relationship. Christ, after the first three years, it was plain sailing. You know, you, your your life and career. There's so many different jobs, but that breakfast radio and radio was a big part of it. Did you enjoy that structure of like the early mornings, and you did three hours work, and then you had the rest of the day to yourself? Oh, plus the prep, mate. Don't 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 sleep on the plus prep. The I'm sure there was plenty of prep there, Dino. Well. The prep I would do is get in it. If we started at six, I'd be there at two minutes to six and read the paper. That's pretty much the limit of my prep. And then I'd be out straight away. But I can say this. Uh, radio is without doubt the world's easiest and greatest job. You know, I, I come out of school and I was basically had three jobs, which I love doing, right? One, I was playing rugby league and I was getting paid a little bit for that. Then I was cleaning at the school that I went to, Massey High School, and then I was working on my dad's trucks as, a, as an offsider delivering Coca-Cola. So, uh, and at times, you know, I was out at Coca-Cola working on the floor, um, packing loads and sort of loading trucks up and what have you, working 12-hour shifts. And it was like people on radio didn't understand how good it was. Like at that stage, it wasn't getting paid much. I think I started out on 50 grand for three hours a day. And it was like, fucking how good is this? You know what I mean? And if you go to Sydney, that's a million dollars for three hours a day. Don't let anyone fool you in the media that their jobs are hard. Like in terms of the, the media has changed a lot, right? So nowadays, the days of particularly sports journalists, you know, they have to work so damn hard. Well, he doesn't. Well, but you, 
<laughs> but you have to work hard. Like I've got a mate of mine in Australia, Pete Bedell. He's probably the number one journalist in News Corp. That guy gets paid according to how hard he works, and he is the hardest working journo, in my opinion, probably in Australasia. He is by far and away, as a result of that hard work, he is um, he is the best journo full stop, and he gets more clicks through News Limited and the Courier Mail than any other journal in the country because he talks to everyone that he has to talk to. Whereas I think, in my opinion, this sort of, sort of format, you guys obviously do your research, which is great, but it's a pretty, you know, so long as you get paid, it's a pretty easy job. And Radio Haraki at that time, we went through some changes because um, uh, the group as a whole was losing money, so they had to cut me down to like 38 grand a year, and I spat tax and carried on. But at the end of the day, it was still 38 grand back then. Uh, for doing three hours a day, which is a pretty cruisy number. So uh, don't let anyone tell you that radio is a hard gig because it ain't. Where did the Warriors marketing and sponsorship, did that run in parallel? Did you have to uh, 905 no, no, you down no, at no, Ericsson no. Stadium? Or? At one stage, uh, there was changes in management and in Hauraki. And they decided that I was too much in a pain in the ass and they wanted some changes. So they got rid of me, which was great. And my good friend John Murdoch came in, uh, who is an, a specialist uh, in in. in basically laying people off, so he knew the law backwards. So we got laid off from Hauraki, and he managed to get us out a decent redundancy payment, which came tax-free through special clauses. So he was a genius at that. And then I went straight from there into um, uh, the management at the Warriors. Uh, I was running sponsorship and marketing over there, and I really enjoyed it. It was a time when Ty Nui owned it, and Graham Lowe and Malcolm Boyle had a shareholding, and so they were, they were sitting on the board. Trevor McEwen, uh, who used to be a... Used to be my my boss, head of sport at the Herald. There you go. And Trevor's a wonderfully good bloke, but, mate, um, no qualifications (laughs) to be senior management of a rugby league team. (laughs) And the team went accordingly. You know, like, I've told Trevor this. He'd had about four jobs, and they'd all failed miserably (laughs) when he turned up, and I've always given him a hard time about it. But he's actually a really good bloke. He's a superb journo. And uh, he's now... His real passion is surfing, and he's got some really cool initiatives going around theme park surfing in this country, which I won't go further into. But yeah, he's, he, but we had a wonderful time at the Warriors. Unfortunately, we weren't successful on the field, and that directly relates back to how much money comes through the gate. And the, the NRL now, it's very, very hard to run a club, no matter how bad you go and lose money because of the incredible revenue streams that Peter Volandis has created through a combination of TV rights and, and merchandise. And the Warriors right now, they are making seriously good money week in, week out, and good luck to them, they deserve to. But back then, you know, you could lose money quite significantly. And Tainui, unfortunately, they lost a lot of money and they had to sell it at the end. And I think that's when Eric Watson picked it up. So uh, I had my time in there and had a really good time. Um, really enjoyed it, actually. And Trev, as it turned out, even though <laughs> I don't think... He knew too much about running rugby league clubs. He's a good guy to work with. Yeah, you know, great guy. really good guy to work with. And we had a lot of camaraderie, and it was, you know, a lot of the guys uh, I'd played with. Like I think Sammy Parnapa was there, and there's a, you know, Mark Graham was there he, as as a senior coach. Lowy was sort of floating around, so it was a really cool environment. It was a really lot of fun to be part of it. The the Dean Lonigan timeline to me, it seems, you know, successful rugby league career and you get into breakfast radio and I didn't these have warriors. A, I didn't have a successful rugby league be, be, career. Being a professional rugby a, league player is, I was just is a, a success. I was just a battler who had a crack. Yeah. Like the, the, look at the successful rugby league players of my era were like uh, Brent Todd, definitely. Toddy, Toddy always... Whatever you got of Toddy was always 100% the best Toddy had to offer. He was remarkable in that way. You speak about honest media quotes, one of the greatest media quotes of all time, Brent Todd when he signed for the Gold Coast Seagulls. Yes, yes. That's incredible. I can't what paraphrase. Is, what I can't, is, so you can't just, you can't well, just say I, that without it was, saying what I, he said. I'll, I'll paraphrase it because I don't know, but he said something like, the Sheilas are hot down here and I want to fuck them all. That's exactly <laughs> what he said. And uh, I don't know that they put, they probably beat, they it's a, there's, out. A, there's a blooper on, it's, on it's, YouTube. It's, 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 yeah, I've seen that. And <laughs> Gary Freeman was another very successful rugby league player, you know, who, from my era. Clayton Friend, Hugh McGahn, you know, those guys were successful. I was just, I thought I was good. It's all, all about perspective. Just about, I'm coming from a guy who would have loved a professional sporting career. So the yeah. fact that you made it, in my book, man, I'm classifying you well, as I a probably had the, um, I had the wrong, I probably had the wrong uh, goals, to be honest. And the, I only ever, I remember in... 1981, I think it was. Might have been 81, 82. I think it was 81. I was um, playing rugby league. Was it 83? Might have been 83. Mate, your memory play. I was playing rugby league for the Glenora under-18s. And I remember watching a test match. I'm pretty sure it was 83. 
sitting on the couch with my mate Redvis McCabe, and we were watching this test match, and the Kiwis won and beat Australia. It was the first time in like 10 years, and I'm looking at this thing going, how good is that? I'd love to do that. Love to have a crack. So my whole goal was to play for New Zealand and play in a test match or test matches that beat the Aussies. That was it. Mm. The goal wasn't at that stage to go and play over in Australia and play in England and all that sort of stuff. It was just to do that. And we managed to achieve that. And unfortunately, I didn't reassess the goals as you should at the time. But, and I finished at 25, 26 roundabouts. And I've got to tell you, now that I see all these guys coming out like Wally Lewis or CTE, um, where they're starting to have you know, serious problems with uh, remembering shit and their lives are going to change significantly as they de- degenerate. I'm so glad I came yeah. up at that age because I promise you it's all the guys just ahead of me that are getting this. Mm-hmm. So at some stage, my generation is going to start coming out and say, yes, I've got it, I've got it. Now you've got Carl Heyman, I think, and the All Blacks have already come out and said he's yeah. got it. So I'm, uh, I'm so glad that I gave it up. And I can promise you this, it's got nothing at all to do with high tackles and stuff like that, in my opinion. It's got everything to do with the the sheer physicality of the game where you get guys who stand 15, 20 metres apart and one of them runs as fast as they possibly can at probably 15, 20 kilometres an hour and they get stopped. And when they get stopped, yes, you take a physical hit to the body, but the brain, the head stops, the brain keeps going forward. And if you do that enough times in your career... You're going to have it's just going to it just happens, you know. So you don't have to be getting punched in the head or hitting the head, high shots and all that sort of stuff. And what's really fascinating is the guys who've got the most head injuries in Australia, the AFL guys, and I can only put that down to they're going up high on a regular basis and they're coming down on their backs and their heads and they're taking massive massive hits because it's not a high contact sport. But obviously, when they collide with the ground, when you're going up as high as they go. It's but a isn't, real it, isn't it also more about the smaller knot? Like it's not necessarily the big ones. It's the culmination yeah, of think, smaller knots. So yeah, maybe agreed. jumping and coming down that is, uh, you know, 50 but I times think a it's game. I think it's an issue, and the problem is, and NFL has it in a massive way, and they've done a, multi, a multi-billion-dollar settlement for players in the past uh, for this sort of stuff. And they, the NFL's fundamental problem is, is that they use they think that the helmets save them. It doesn't. It does the opposite. If they wanted to save themselves, they'd get rid of the helmets and rely on tackling with their shoulders. Because, mate, how many NFL players do you see making tackles and charging ahead, using, leading with their head? It's just stupidity, and they wonder why they've got these head injuries at the back end, and they think the helmet saves them. It doesn't. It does the opposite. So I think that's going to be a massive issue going forward for both rugby well, league and rugby union. Just while we're in league, was that why you retired? Was it concussion-related no, symptoms? No, no, not at all. Just, just no, no. I, uh, I, I wanted to get overseas to Australia and play over there, and I'd had one season over there on a thing called the Rookie Scheme, I think in 89 or 90 or 91, roundabouts. I played for the Canberra Raiders for one year, and then we all had to come back. Uh, but Tony Kemp was one of the guys who was selected. There's me, there's Tawira, there's Tony, and a few other guys. <laughs> Tony was of the opinion that, well, I don't want to go back to Taranaki and go back and work in the freezing works. I want to stay in Newcastle and play rugby league. So he took, back then, to get away, you had to have two tours uh, with the Kiwis or you played six tests. And uh, there was also a transfer fee of about 20, 30 grand that went with that. So it was basically a restraint of trade. So Tony Kemp took the New Zealand Rugby League to court at that time, and it cost him, I think, about 80 grand. And he won. And he was right in so much it was a restraint of trade. And that's when the floodgates opened of New Zealand players going into Australia and pursuing careers because they didn't have to have the two tests. You had to either do that or stand down for two years. Now, year, earlier, than, oh. earlier than that, the Sorensons, the first guys to go to Australia were the Sorensen brothers, and they stood down for two years and then played for Cronulla and Olsen Filipana, you know, and they were the guys who, uh, who started this whole thing off. And now you've seen a floodgate of New Zealand players or people who have been through New Zealand, particularly Auckland, but also New Zealand. There's probably make up, you know, between Māori and Polynesia and Pacifica, you're probably talking 50% of the entire playing uh, um, stocks. So it's fair to say that. New Zealand Rugby League has a lot to thank Tony Kemp for. All New Zealand Rugby League players have a lot to thank Tony Kemp for because he put his balls and his money on the line, took the NZR out of court, and he uh, he opened the floodgates. So, and a lot of people have forgot, forgotten that. And Tony now works for SENZ, I yeah, believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of people don't understand he's part of the very, very rich yeah. history of the game in this country, and he's a major... He, I'm sure at some stage it would have come to the fore, but he was the one who had the balls to take it on. He put his own money up. And he was the one that opened the floodgates. And I think a lot of New Zealand rugby league players 
can thank Tony for what he did because it has led to tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars over the last 20 years flowing into their pockets. So it's a wonderful, he did a very good thing. You guys have taken me on a rugby league detour. I was getting somewhere with a point there, and you guys have hijacked. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I was painting yeah. the picture. It started with me saying you had a successful career at rugby league, which we we can debate. But from then, it seemed like uh, you you sort of started in the promotion stuff. You did breakfast radio. You got in the promotions. You're doing mm-hmm. fight for life, which was really go. It seemed like it was snowballing year after year. Yeah. And I want to take did. us to 2006 is where I want to get to because right. it seems like what happened then? That was Cirque Rocks. Ah. Because it seems like from, oh, from, what your, a fuck out that from was. your story <laughs> is that this was a really foundational moment of your career in life and that the amount of money you lost and the mistakes you made. But then was the that ability Cirque to Rocks or Circus X? I think we did too. One of them broke even. I, yeah, I remember we, we, we took Fight for Life. Uh, we slowly morphed it into an entertainment event rather than just boxing. So when we first started, it was just a boxing event and made it was great. And then I slowly morphed it into you know bringing down the zenith of Fight for Life one of the, the high points was we had 300, I'd sold 300 tables of 10, so at about six grand each. So it was that 1.8 million turnover. And then we had money coming in from, a little bit of money coming in from TV and sponsorship. And, um, but we still didn't make any money out of it, right? Because I put on this amazing extravaganza of music and entertainment. So I had like a hundred piece band. <laughs> and how do you have a hundred piece? We had about 20 piece in the rock band, you know, because we had backing vocalists and we had, the horns and all sorts. We had a choir, 30 or 40 piece choir, and then we had an orchestra behind that again. So we had this massive musical thing and the zenith of what we did, we had the world's best freestyle motocross guys out of America coming down doing backflips over the boxing ring to Leonard Skinner's Freeburn with his 100 piece band. It was, it was amazing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? And we, I, I brought down bloody um, motorcycle foot jugglers out of Russia. I brought down, because um, I, I met a circus... I was going to say, yeah. Well, I mean, a circus pre- agent kind of in America. Googling. No, no, no. The, yeah, yeah. We, we, I, I went over and saw this lady. She was, she was had an amazing circus background, and she came from Florida. And I went down and sat down with her and said, this is what I need. And she found me all these acts from around the world, and they were incredible. And then I thought, oh, well, if we can do this with Fight for Life, I can start my own circus. And in circuses, you've got there's some certain fundamentals you've got to have right. Mm-hmm. And the fundamentals are this, is that the longer you have them in play, the longer you engage them, right, the less they charge it's on a per weekly basis. The worst thing you can do with a circus is put one together for a week, fly people in from all around the world, because if you have them together for a long time, all their airfares um, get amortised over the course of that 52 weeks, let's just say. You, and then you go on tour, and you're in a tent, which doesn't cost you anything, and then you go into different towns and you set up and you've, your costs are through the floor, right? So you don't have to turn over too much to make money. If, you, and if you've got a really good circus, like a Cirque du Soleil, mate, they print money, but they come to big venues and they'll do for as long as they possibly can to make sure all the costs are coming in are amortised. Anyway, so I put together this massive circus to start with called uh, yeah, Cirque Rocks or Circus X, I can't remember, Cirque Rocks. And uh, it, was a, it was about oh, it was two and a half million to put the bloody thing on and and I'd only, I turned over about one and a half million, so I'm a million short and I got no assets to back it. Then I'd made some other mistakes. Anyway, I ended up with about $1.8 million in debt. Very, very stressful time in my life because all yeah. I can see is that uh, if I go bankrupt or if I go broke, I'm going to have every man and his dog put me on the front cover of the paper. I'm going to be seen as a fucking arsehole. Don't pay my bills. So... I, I had a few staff, so I laid all them off, and I sat down with my creditors, and I said to them, look, i got this problem. Here's my hole. It's this big. If you hang tough with me, I'll get you your money back, but just don't call me up right now. I'll eventually pay you off. I then turned around and went to about three or four different people. I borrowed half a million bucks. I got you know quite a large check off my dad. I got some money off my sister. I got some money off a girlfriend at the time who was incredible to do what they did. And I had about half a million, so I went around and I sort of divvied it up between the creditors, and then I went to work on coming up with a whole lot of low risk. I'd work for anyone for any price to get it done, right? So I went on to contract with a few people. Um, and then I, I came up with a whole lot of low risk events. And what I would do is I'd go and sell these things like we had corporate stock car racing at a Wakaraka Park. And uh, we'd sell that in and I'd make money off that. But what I'd do is I'd have money coming in and I'd pay off some some debts you know but you're creating new debts on the way through which is not an issue so long as you make your profit on all gigs on the way through 
So that took me four years to pay off. I've got to tell you, for the first year, I was probably depressed. And the only way you can, uh, the only way you can uh, escape the pressure, and it's like a heavy, wet blanket on you all the time. The only way you can escape the pressure is to go to sleep. So you go to sleep, and um, and then you wake up, and the pressure's all back. And the worst thing you can do, well, I felt you could do, was going through this was was to drink alcohol, and um, and the reason for that is uh, the pressure and the pain and the hurt disappears for three, four, five, six hours but the next three days it comes back worse. So I kicked drinking for touch and it took me four years to pay all the money back. And then um, uh, at the bottom, at the back end of that, I didn't feel like drinking anymore because I'd lost a taste for it. So I don't, I might go out once a year nowadays and have a couple of beers, but that's it on the whole. I find alcohol, you know, I don't, I don't like the taste of it myself. And I find that people start talking a different language when they get on the drink and they become a giant pain in the ass. At the so bo- I, I, I avoid it all. At the bottom of that pit, when you're 1.8 mil in debt, is that number just hovering over you every day? Yeah. Like, are you thinking about like how, what a hole point. that is to climb out of? Yeah, it is. It was it was a big hole, and I, you know, at times I didn't, I, I couldn't pay my fucking phone bill. Like, and the mobile phone is the thing that uh, that keeps you alive, you know, to cut deals. So it was a while ago now, and you know, it's all part of the life's experience. But I managed to. Yeah, it's just, it's not nice. But you had belief in yourself that you would get out of it? Did it take a while to get that confidence back? It took a long time to get the confidence back, you know, like, uh, and you just think, what have I done? Seriously, that's the old, you know, how stupid am I to do what I've done? But, you know, you go to work, did I have belief? No. All you had was the ability to get up every day and do something to try and chip away at the bills and the debts. And here's the stupid thing. With the benefit of hindsight and as you get older, um, all the worry and the stress and the depression didn't help nothing. You know what I mean? And like when you, you're better to go, if you can, try and clear your head and attack things logically, right? But I guess to some degree the pain that you go through is what drives you to get the shit done. And uh, it was a shitty time in my life and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. 1.8 million for a lot of people is nothing. You know what I mean? They'd laugh at that amount, but for me it was a lot of huge amount of money, and I had nothing to back it at the time from an asset point of view, so I couldn't sell assets to pay the bills off. So all I had was um, the ability to put my head down, ass up, and, and, and drive forward, you know, and it took me the first three years were difficult because the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel was a huge way off. But towards the end, you know, with a year to go, you go, right, now I know I can get there, and. Uh, you know, it's, it, it was only after three years that the pressure started to disappear. You know, and I, and I wouldn't want to go through that again. Is it one of those things you look back on, and a lot of the guests we've had, the biggest failures are the things I've learned the most from. And we're going to talk about out the other side the successes you've had. But did you learn so much from those failures that made you a better Man, sort of promoter? I don't, I don't know, to be bluntly honest. You know, like I can promise you, for all sorts of different reasons in the uh, career we've chosen, you have your ups and your downs. You know what I mean? And did I learn? Yeah, you learn to mitigate risk as much as you possibly can. Um, but then you have outside things, you know, like straight up I've taken Jai Pataita court, which I don't want to do, but we're doing it. Because we spent a huge amount of money and I had factored into the budget so we're going to be fighting world titles this year. We're finally going to get a return on investment. The young fellow's going to make a lot of money, you know. And the path for Jai is so obvious for me, but, you know, those clowns still haven't fought yet. He was ready to fight on April 29, which is what I had. I had him fights lined up in the UK, fight after fight after fight. You know, his view was just get me the biggest fights and the biggest money. So I went out and did that. And then all of a sudden the management thinks it's a good idea to leave. And instead of having been on the second or third fight now, he's on fight none because he's poorly managed and poorly promoted at the moment. So frustrating, but you know, and those things come out of the blue. So what do you learn out of that? You learn sometimes you can't trust people that you thought you were doing the right thing by. And I don't blame Jai at all, I just blame his management. So um, do you learn? Yeah, I guess. And, and, and when you do go through that, you don't want to go through it again, so you do anything you can to sort of mitigate the risk. But, but, you, go ahead. but you are in the risk business. Every yeah. event that you put on is, is, well, is a risk. So I'll give you an example, right? So if you want to mitigate risk, you've just got to minimise cost or maximise your revenues. 
So you look at your variable revenues in my game and they come in two parts at the moment because we're still building them and that is your GA ticket sales and um, your pay-per-view revenues. We're in the middle of doing something we've never done before and that is trying to promote two world woman champions in Lani and, and Mia. And so you've got to find different places to where the value lies, you know, and so my job is to go out and sell and sell and sell. So if I can sell enough sponsorship in, my risk goes down because my getting to the break-even point comes closer. It's when the break-even point's a long, long way off that it's quite scary. So you've got to bring break-even as close as you possibly can and you've just got to sell your ass off until you get there. So can I take... Mitigating risk. So can I take a, a, a real point and you talk about those two extremes of the GA and your pay-per-view, can you take us then to Jeff Horn, Manny Pacquiao? 51,000 yeah. in the stadium at Suncorp in Brisbane and 50,000 pay-per-views? Yeah, we had about probably closer to 63,000 pay-per-views, which was actually uh, a pretty shitty amount considering the quality of the fight. And they went out at 59 bucks, I think, and we had a bigger split. Your normal split on pay-per-views, 50-50, we had about a, a 65-40, 35 split, I think, that way, in our favour because of the risk. So with Manny Pacquiao, that took a long time to put together because Pacquiao at that time was one of the biggest fighters in the world, you know. Mm. Uh, but he'd had two or three fights in America and the last one with Timothy Bradley hadn't gone that well. And so Bob Arum, his promoter, was looking to, to get a fight for Manny. And we said to him, well, we've got this kid, Jeff Horn. Bob says, no, 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 Jeff Horn, I don't know, I've never heard of him. So we had the fight with Joe Parker down here with Andy Ruiz, and we put Jeff Horn on the undercard, and Bob was obviously down here for that. And Bob's a fascinating character from top rank. He's been around and seen everything. And uh, he saw Jeff Horn during the week, good, clean-cut kid, You know, um, spoke well in the media, looked fantastic, performed really well on the night, and Bob says, yeah, if you can get the money together, we'll, 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 we'll do it. I said, sweet. So then went to the Queensland government, this is shortening things up, Queensland government, they gave us $5 million for the fight uh, based on uh, we would generate a huge amount of tourism, you know, money into the economy, and it turned out, you know, it was in, an enormous success. Uh, I think the Queensland Museum, of all things, did more people through the gate on the Saturday before the fight than they'd ever done before because, <laughs> mate, interstate travel over there is a big deal. You know, we had tens of thousands of people coming from interstate, staying in hotels, eating in restaurants, you know, going out to the museums and do whatever they did. So uh, the five million up front made a big difference. The second, uh, we sold about, I can't remember, we sold about four or five million dollars in corporate hospitality. And then I think there's another two or three million came through the gate. But you knew it was going to be a success when we put the th on sale for the first day. We sold 15,000 tickets. And, um, Manny, Manny bought most of those, didn't he? <laughs> well, Manny, Manny, Manny was an interesting cat. He's a really good guy and very generous. Manny did something I've never seen before because Top Rank used to talk because with every fighter they get an allocation of tickets to go to the event and Manny might have had 20 or 30 in the front row but Manny ended up spending what did he spend he spent about $800,000 on tickets no shit for all of his mates to come he brought down a private jet like a 757 like a big jet out of the Philippines that was full with all his mates he brought about 800 grand worth of tickets and off the top of my head, and I can't remember the number exactly, but as he got off the plane uh, and come into the hotel, I had to give him, it was either a quarter of a million bucks or half a million bucks Australian in folding. Like, well, this obviously wow. comes off his purse. Well, in a suitcase. Like, what, no, no, no shit. That's exactly. A suitcase full of cash. Yeah. So we had to sit <laughs> down and life. count it all out. And then Manny had Did a guy. Did you do the thing where you put it on the table and you flip it up and he has a look at it and go no no yeah, no no no, no, bro we count we <laughs> absolutely count so we counted all this money up and manny had a guy and a person that would give tickets and cash out to people who came to the fight who were filipino and uh, where he was staying i can't remember where he's staying but it was like it was like like little manila there were filipinos everywhere because he's such a legend and um the previous biggest fight in Australia was 35,000, I think, to Mundine versus Green. And I reckon there would have been 15,000 Filipinos turned up from all over Australia to come and watch Manny. Oh. And we had 35,000 Aussies there, you know. So that was, a, that, was, that was cool. But Manny Pacquiao was a really, really interesting 
incredibly generous. What's Dean Lonergan like on the day of a fight like that? The biggest fight you've ever put on, all the millions of people watching. Are you stressed out? Are you anxious? Or is it all taken care of and you, you're you've sort of got, hands off? You've got point? a lot of uh, staff helping you out. So on the day, you might have thousands of staff, right? So we will deal. I have one point of contact with a caterer and they might have a thousand people working for them, you know, on that day when you have 51,000 people to serve. So but my point of contact's one. Through two, you'd have people who are sold in corporate hospitality. They'd look after that. Through two, you'd have someone who looks after. You've got to appoint people. If you run around trying to do everything yourself, you drive yourself mental. And you've got to have a good team around you, you know, and that's, that's really important. I'm sure anyone who's run events or run any company will talk about the people around you, make it easy, or they make it hard. And the better the people you've got, the easier it is. And how much do you care about the result? What, do you just care that it's it oh, really runs care. smoothly? Oh, no, no, no. I really care about the result. Like for Jeff Horn to win that fight was massive. I mean massive because all of a sudden that changed the landscape of Australian boxing. Mm. You know, And now you've got a really vibrant Australian uh, landscape for boxing and you've got guys coming through. But that was just enormous. And, of course, it gave us – and Jeff, he went from making – the fight before that, he fought here, he made $35,000. On that fight, he made, I think, $1.1 million because he had a base plus bonuses. And Manny, Manny took the bulk of it. Like, he just, it was just one big scoop. But, you know, Manny, um, he would have spent a huge amount. Um, and then Jeff went on to multiple million-dollar paydays from there, you know, and probably made in his career. He might have had, I can't remember, he might have had 12, 15 fights with us. And in the last five or six fights, he probably made close to 7 million bucks, roundabouts. And uh, as a result, Jeff's, um, you know, and you do that over a short period of time. Like, he would have done that over a two-year period, and then he, he kicked it for touch after that. Was he a school teacher or something like yeah, that? Yeah, he was a school teacher. And what's interesting, like, his wife, <laughs> uh, lovely lady, and they've got, I think, three kids now. When she married Jeff, you know, yes, he was into boxing, but I don't think she expected any of this. And you want to talk about a guy whose life goes on fast forward? Like, the week after the fight or two weeks after the fight, top rank took him up to America because... Uh, the way deals work, you don't just get Jeff by yourself. You want to fight Manny Pacquiao, you've got to give up a thing called options. So all of a sudden, we're co-promoters on this, and we, we lose a little bit of control, but the money's flowing, so you don't mind so much. Uh, Jeff gets taken up to America to go to the ESPYs, and he's meeting Le Le LeBron James, and he's meeting Michael Jordan. He's in the same company as these sort of people. And we had we had massive American sports stars commenting on the result because it you know, it was a beautiful day in Brisbane and we fought mm. it in the afternoon. It went back to prime time USA. Mm. He just got this tough, tough, tough white school school teacher <laughs> fighting one of the all time great fighters of all time and yeah. just and Jeff always bled a lot. So the fight was quite spectacular. And we had guys like Jim Harbaugh who was commenting on the fight. You know, he's one of the all time great NFL coaches over there. There's, and there's multiple people like that. You know, it was quite interesting, and Jeff will talk about it if you've ever, uh, you'll probably never get to talk to him, but his, his life went on fast forward because all of a sudden there was all these promotional things to do, and then we're fighting again, and then there's the promotional thing goes through the roof. And the biggest thing, we're in the media business, right? That's what we do. So the biggest transformation for any boxer is to come out of the vacuum of just training and fighting and going into the spotlight of training, media, and fighting. And I can promise you the media is easily as important as the fighting mm. if you want to get paid. If you want to get paid $5,000 for the rest of your life, sweet, don't go and do the media. But if you want to make the multi-million dollars and when you get to 30 or 31 or 32 and want to finish and not have to work again and you've got all sorts of choices in your life, get on the media circuit because that's where you make money. But the media has changed immeasurably in the last six, seven, eight, nine years, you know, and the... Um, we're doing a podcast here, you know, 15 years ago, these things didn't exist. And it's only been in the last three, four or five years with the you know, proliferation of Joe Rogan and how massive he's become and, and people have seen what you can do. Podcasts are everywhere now and this long form interview on radio and TV that never used to happen is happening in a big way because of what Rogan's done, you know, so it's just changing. It's probably a good time to talk about Joseph Parker because his journey you know, when he started off, he was quite shy and, and perhaps not that good in front of the camera, but he developed over the years. You've already said you didn't give them media training, but was there a strategy behind elevating his profile? Just throw him in. And like what we had to do, there's a guy called Noel Thornbury who uh, is part of a very famous family in Australia called the Fighting Thornburys. And his brother, Ricky, fought uh, Joe Calzaghi at middleweight, lost over 12 rounds. But it's one of the, Calzaghi's one of the all-time greats because he's unbeaten uh, Welshman at middleweight. And um, But Noel said, you've got to fight five times a year because that's what makes him better. So we 
listened to the advice and fought Joe five times a year. And when you fight them five times a year, there's lots of media commitments to do. So Joe would fight, would send him on a media tour, which would start in Auckland. You'd go to Hamilton. I'd go down, I think, to, to Napier, to Wellington, then to the South Island. Then you'd come back. Joe would be hang out with his family, but then shoot back to Las Vegas with Kevin Barry. You know, so and so Joe got a lot of media attention, and he's superb in the media now. You know, he's really, really good. So, uh, and the strategy was just fight regularly. And when you're fighting regularly, you get a lot of media attention as well. If you only fight twice a year, it's only you know twice a year you get media attention because New Zealand media in particular don't want to cover fights and or cover um, uh, they don't want to, they don't want to cover things until one or two weeks before. So I'm always fighting trying to get stories out there because that's the business we're in. But if you fight more regularly, you're going to be in the more media more regularly, and that's just and it worked really well with Joe. And my Joe. Joe embraced it. He was fantastic. He never complained once. Sometimes he'd get tired and Kevin would pipe up and say, oh, do he has to go. But he always did it and he did a good job. And as a result, the rewards came Joseph's way. So he, his biggest payday ever was when he fought Anthony Joshua in front of 75000 and made, he made serious money. And then, uh, you know, he had multiple excellent paydays on the way through while well, defending the world title against, I think, uh, Fury. He did one and he beat Andy Ruiz, which he got paid pretty well for for that. And it's accumulation, you know, of, of multiple paydays that makes... Uh, the, the, and Joe's been smart, from what I can understand, uh, and he's, he's kept a lot of his money, and I don't think, you know, when he finishes, he, if he chooses not to work again, he'll probably not have to. And that's what's wonderful, because there's, there's two things... There's, there's a chat that I have when, I, when we sign fighters. There's two things I want for them. I want them to come out of it wealthy, but I also want them to come out of it healthy. And the great thing about Joe is he's still super healthy. You know, and hopefully he'll finish in one or two years and he's done everything he wanted to do. I would love to see Tyson Fury go, you know what, Joe, I'm going to look after you for the rest of your life. Let's have one fight. Yeah. And that, <laughs> that Fury fight brings massive money to the table. He did it with Derek Chisora, but I don't think it'll ever happen because him and Joe, are, from what I can see, are really, really good mates. Seems like it. Yeah, and Joe spends a lot of time with Tyson Fury when he's up there uh, in the UK. So, yeah, Joe's... Joe's got a lovely family, you know, he's, um, he's now got a multiple kids, which is fantastic, and his mum and dad have, I've always had a good relationship with, and uh, they, they come over to Australia, I think, for a fight with Paul Gallon, when Paul Gallon fought uh, Justice Hooney, and we look after them with tickets, and I've always, you know, invite them to fight for life whenever they want to come, so mate, they're good, uh, they're very good people. Yeah, you had, you had so many good years with Joe and with Duco. And then there was a bit of a messy ending, and, and you've separated from, from the partnership there. How do you reflect on your time with Duco and, and what happened? Oh, if I had my time again, when I went into business with it, I would never have done it if I had my time again. Um, and the reason is very simple, is that we, we, we split for a very, very specific reason. He, did, he played with something that's very precious to me and uh, broke my trust. And one day, I'll tell the story. That's it. So we, we, we end up, after about six months of backwards and forwards, Liam and myself end up going over to Australia. We took Jeff Horn. Joe stayed with, with, with Duco. And, um, and we did our stuff in Australia, you know. And it was a fascinating learning curve being over there, as I've said before. It's a really, really, really tough place to do business. But, you know, it's all part of the rich tapestry of life. Do you look back with any fondness at like the Auckland Nines or yeah. the Brisbane Tens the nines, and, and elements the, of, of that time? Look, the Nines was probably the most gratifying thing that I've ever done as a rugby league guy. Because I was, I remember I went over to see Tim Sheens about something. I can't remember what it was. And, and there was a picture of Benji Marshall up on, the, up on the wall. And it was when Benji made his debut. Uh, in rugby league, and it was in the nines tournament. I think it was in, like in Fiji or something like that. And I had in the back of my mind, I knew how successful the rugby sevens had been down in Wellington, and they'd had generation. They had twenty five years of great success down there. And it's sort of, uh, I, I talked to Shinzi about it on that day, and says, "How do you reckon the nines would go if we did that in Auckland?" Because I knew how big the sevens was. And he said, "Yeah." And then from there, it germinated. And two or three years later, we end up doing the nines. And what was gratifying about it? was that we got to do a whole lot of things that I knew that the Auckland Rugby League clubs <coughs> desperately wanted. So we, um, on the first one round, we had all of the teams that came over, went out to the Rugby League clubs and did signing sessions out there. And, and what was gratifying is I called into the Attitude uh, Roosters when it was happening. I also called into Point Chev. And mate, there were like hundreds, if not thousands of people lining up to sort of shake hands and interact with the league players and then we did some major uh, activations in downtown Auckland 
And in the first alliteration, we had 90,000 people turn up over two days, you know, 45,000 people a day, incredibly well-behaved crowd, you know, and a crowd that went there to have a lot of fun. And when the Warriors played, they cheered loudly. So that, from a, um, with my rugby league background, that was probably the most gratifying thing that I, you know, we did when we were there. Um, obviously, look, I'll be straight up, I wasn't, it, while it was my idea, there was, you know, a whole company that was putting it together. Higgins actually had some good ideas along the way, and we did a presentation. I remember we did a presentation to the NRL. Went, 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 went very, very well. I've been told on multiple occasions it's the best presentation that they've ever seen, mm. and that was what sort of what clinched the deal. But what really clinched the deal is that we went to the Auckland Council first and says, "Look, this is what we want to do. That's what goes down on Wellington. This will be bigger and better. Um, can you give us this amount of money?" and Initially, you know, the people we spoke to said, oh, that's just too expensive. And then we spoke to some people on the board and they said, this could go good. And, and as it did, it did go good. And we had three years out of it. And the thing, the reason why it failed is that with the, when, when you had the, the sevens, the All Blacks or the New Zealand team, you always, there was a hope that they could win, right? Yeah. Because you thought they would win. And they probably won half the time that they were down there. And the All Blacks during the year and the All Blacks brand was very strong and they always won. Whereas with the Warriors, they were going through a period of not so good winning. You know, in fact, I don't think they made the finals at any stage. So there was no real local... Look, there's three things that drive any sports event. It's stars, it's parochialism, it's perceived competition, right? So stars is probably 50% of the equation. The bigger the stars... And, of course, one of the things that was happening is the rugby league clubs were holding their stars back... Uh, because they thought, well, yeah, if we win the nines, great. It doesn't mean shit to the competition, and that's what I'm really judged on. So that was one. Um, you know, perceived competition, that's about this is going to be a really great game. And When the Warriors weren't winning during the season, no one had any faith that the Warriors could win in the nines, you know. Yeah. So it is what it is. Can, yeah. I, can I just jump in? When you went to Auckland Council, yep. <clears throat> did you employ the 40-30-20-10 rule in that negotiation? The Brian Tracy con the Brian Tracy approach. Yeah, we apply that in every conversation. Could you? Brian Tracy is without doubt the world's greatest sales coach of all time, and he talks about um, he talks about in all of his books that when you go to sell something to somebody, nobody's going to buy anything off you unless they trust you, and people don't trust you when all you do is sit and talk. So. You know, you boys have been great. You've been asking me a lot of questions. I've been doing a lot of talking. But if you're in a sales presentation, the last thing you want a salesperson doing is doing all the talking, right? So what you should be doing is talking about them and what they do and how they got onto their business. So you can talk 40% is about sort of establishing a relationship. At the start, where are you from? What have you done? The smartest thing you can do is recognize stuff in the office, right? So if someone's got pictures of planes up, the first thing you do is ask about the planes, and then it just conversation flows from there. 30%, you'll do a bit of a diagnostic on their business in relation to the product that you've got to offer. Um, you know, you'll ask specific business questions. and then you This is sounding very familiar for when you came in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking back. He said he asked us about the ACC <laughs> and the sponsorship <laughs> and how, how the business that is. I've got to be honest, when I'm in talking to people, I have a natural curiosity about how stuff works because I actually, it fascinates me what's going on in media at the moment, right? And I've been lucky enough, some of the best times in business that I've had is not sitting there watching the 51,000 or the 90,000, which is a lot of fun. I've got to tell you, it's, it's gratifying to see that when it happens. When an idea comes to fruition and you fill the stadiums and you make money, it's fantastic. But some of the most gratifying things that I'll be lucky enough to do is to get out and go and see people in their environment of their business and see what they do. And I love, like I was, I was in bloody... Um, Fongaray last week and I went and saw this company that's very very well established and they're in electrical stuff big company 500 staff nationwide very very successful but uh, and I was fascinated hearing about that but this company and the, the CEO have developed this uh, electric propulsion system for boats and they're doing some really amazing stuff and they uh, they did some stuff down in Wellington with the, the electric, first electric ferries in the world down there and they're doing, and it was just fascinating listening to them and like telling, they are telling you, oh, I'm lucky enough that a lot of people tell me their stories in relation to their business. And a lot of people get very passionate about it because it's a big part of their lives. And I really enjoy listening to it because um, it's interesting to me. You know, and that's, 
that's one of the coolest things. And I've got friends of mine who we've done events with or they've come to my events over multiple years and they turn into mates, mm -hmm. you know? Like I got a guy down in Coromandel, down in Hahe. His name's Jim Johnson. I used to sell stuff to him. And he's just become a mate because he's such a good bastard and mate, <laughs> he spends his life down there now, you know, part of his life living down in Hahi in a very cool life. He goes fishing for crayfish most days out of pots. He takes his allowable limit. You know, he's got a bloody crayfish tank set up in his house. <laughs> and then, he, you know, Jimmy flips the occasional crayfish. So the great thing is when people in business become your friends, you know, and that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're learning that along our journey. You get 90 minutes with someone, you develop a, a connection. I did want, Before we let you go, I did want to talk about family. So like we said, we reached out to Liam, yes. and he said to ask you about your magical mystery tours that you oh. took him on as a kid. Yeah, we used to do things on the weekend. So Liam lived next door, because me and his mum, who were, were great mates, we split up when he was very young. But I've always been in his life. So we used to go on magical mystery tours where we would do three or four things around Auckland, whether it be visiting Kelly Tarleton's, whether it be, uh, what else do we, we used to go up, up north, there's a bit of a shooting range up there, through to, we'd go to the zoo, we'd do all sorts of different stuff. And we, and we used to take his mate, William Walker, who used to live right next door to him, and a great young fella. And when they were super young, like five, six and seven, when you've got one kid and you're out, right? It's a bit of a handful, but it's always fun. When you've got two of them, right, and you might have fed them the wrong stuff, like Liam used to go <laughs> mental on super wine biscuits. He would, <laughs> you feed him super wine biscuits, there's some shit in there. He would be screaming around the house when he was five or six and yelling and carrying on. But you take two young fellas of that age out, and all of a sudden you've got to have the arms of an octopus to keep shit together <laughs> because they just do, you know. So yeah, we used to have a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And, and so now D&L Promotions is Dean and Liam Promotions, it right? What, what's it like working with your son? Like, do you guys ever have conflict? Or, of course. Or how, do you, how do you resolve it? Oh, look. Gets grounded. Go to your room. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's too big to do that now. He's like six foot four and about 125 kilos and strong. So it's fair to say. <laughs> but no, we do. Unfortunately, we do have conflict every now and then, but it gets resolved pretty quickly. You know, and uh, he's doing a great job. He's He's... He's what we call our creative director, but he also signs boxes. He does, when you're in a small company, um, you've got to be able to multitask, you know. And, um, mate, he's just adding huge value to what we do, and he tries stuff out and it works. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, particularly around social media, you know. Like, you know if it works if you get 150,000 views on something. Pretty simple, really. And we're finding more and more, you know, that he can get five, get me, 150,000 views. Me crying over me and Motu will do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you just you just never know what's going to resonate. You know, yeah. like Liam came up with this idea to have Mike King and me and Motu together. And the idea was that they'd tell a couple of jokes. That was it, right? And all of a sudden, and this has only just happened over the last couple of days, he's gone from, you know, 200, 300, 400 views to has exploded to 150,000 views across two or three different platforms and will probably continue to grow. And it's a fun, Mike is funny, me is funny, but it's just, you just don't know what's going to resonate. So we try and put up different stuff than just the guys training or fight footage and stuff like that because everybody's seen that. So uh, you just got to try and resonate in a different way and get cut through wherever you can. Yeah, your, your family's obviously more than Liam and I, mm -hmm. I imagine family's been very central to your, um, your career as you've come up. Has family become more important given the losses that you've suffered and going over to Australia and coming back as again you, now? As you get older, family becomes more important because unfortunately the extended families, they start to pop off. Like I've had aunties and uncles, unfortunately, you know, over the years and cousins who have died. And you get to a point where you go, Jesus, you know, this is, uh, and you guys are 20 years younger than me, I'm guessing you're probably in your 30s or coming up to oh, 40s. Oh, bless you, bless you. But uh, Thanks, I can promise you, as time goes by, you start to value, well, this is just for me, I can't speak for everyone, but as time goes by, you value your time with your family and your friends more and more and more because ultimately that's the important shit, you know, and having the millions of dollars and travelling overseas and doing lots of fun is great, but nobody wants to do that by themselves, right? I've got friends of mine who are extremely wealthy, 
I mean, really, really wealthy. And they do such cool shit. Like they take their whole family overseas and they, they go and have great fun. But ultimately, whether you do it in New Zealand, whether you do it in Onehunga, in Massey, or whether you do it in San Tropez, the key thing is to having a good time is having your good friends around with you and having a laugh and a giggle and doing whatever. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, as you get older, definitely your family becomes more and more important. Well, in that regard, it must be great to be able to go to work every day yeah, with the course. closest member of your family. Oh, of course. Oh, I, I, look, I really love it. I wouldn't want, to, wouldn't want to change it. But one day, the young fella might make a decision that he wants to go and do something else. And if he wants to, well, it's fine and dandy, you know. But uh, you know, we're still... Um, Coming home from Australia, we had like a, uh, a three-year deal, I think it was seven or eight fights a year at a certain level, and we had a, a surety of revenue, and that was quite good. We lost the contract, and I lost the contract, because I didn't quite get my guys there to pay-per-view level in the required time. It just took time, and we, we got caught right at, right at the end of the, the cycle. Our guys were about to explode. And unfortunately, our competitor over there was quite clever and decided that uh, he convinced Fox that they should go with them uh, exclusively and cut us out, even though we started the boxing revolution over there with the, uh, the Jeff Horn fight. So coming back here was quite, um, it was quite a shock, you know what I mean? It took me, for me, it took me a little while to get my head around it. And now it's taken me six to eight months, to be bluntly honest, to get my head around where we've got to go and what we've got to do, you know? And, and we've got a path now that we're set on and I'm incredibly fortunate that I've got an amazing business partner uh, and a guy called Cliff Cook, who's one of New Zealand's um, richest men. And he has been, him and his family have been incredible to us. So I'm very thankful for that. And they've shown patience. And at the end of the day, if you can be patient in what you do and have confidence in what you do and know what you're doing, you're on the right path. It just takes time. You know what I mean? So... Like I said before, we're doing something we've never done before, and that is promote two world champion women. And women's sports is going through an absolute revelation at the moment. It's not, it's not an evolution. It's, like, it's, it's revolution, which is how it exploded with the Rugby World Cup and then this FIFA Women's World Cup. has been incredible. We're going to get there with Mia Alani, you know, and it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be significant, but it just takes time. How many tickets left for the, for the fight night coming up? Uh, there's a few. Yeah, there's a few. You find them. You talk to any promoter, right? And if they know what they're doing, they'll always say, "We're going all right." <laughs> whether you're selling out, whether you're close to selling out or not, because if you're close to selling out, you want to sell everything out <laughs> by, by the night. You know what I mean? And just for people who, the perfect event is that as the main event starts, you sell the last two tickets. That means you got the pricing right perfectly. If you sell out a week before, you got the pricing wrong, right? So that's I haven't quite yet got there with the, the perfect pricing model but uh, look it's been a hell of a journey and uh, yeah it's been interesting to say the least my life has been interesting it has it's been a hell of a tale well, just a it. quick plug for two other guys that we've got Jerome Pampalone uh, is very very clear. he's a light heavyweight he's probably the best light heavyweight one of the best prospects to ever come out of this country and I think he can easily become a world champion he's only two fights away I think from world title and Andre Mikhailovich um these are both products of the Peach Boxing Gym. And Andre is one fight away from a world title. So uh, we've got some exciting times. This, in my opinion, this is a golden age of New Zealand boxing. You've still got Joe Parker out there. Joe's just gone back to the UK because I believe he's got a fight lined up soon. Uh, you've, and you've got the, the entire Peach stable. There's nothing short of outstanding. So, And I think my advice would be you get Alina and Isaac to come in and have a chat about what they're doing. Because yeah. they are an incredible couple who do an amazing job and they're changing lives out there. And Mia's probably one of the, the most obvious ones, but they're doing some incredible things for, for their boxing gym and the community. So uh, they're definitely a couple you want to get in. I think it's a great shout. Shay? You, you mentioned before, and just to kind of wrap us up, you get the privilege to, to sit and listen to fascinating stories, and that's exactly what Steve and I get to do on this podcast and ask interesting, interesting questions. And it's been great. I, I find the best episodes are the ones where I find myself just captured in listening to the stories and, and gleaning little nuggets of things that can help. And the two things I pulled out are patience and confidence in our own kind of journey. We've been going for four years now and probably this is the year where things have started to happen. So we've been very patient but always been very confident in mm. what we do and how we do it and it's coming to fruition. So it's great to kind of get that um, reflected back, listening to someone who's been in the game for a long time and put on a lot of great events 
but also lived the life and learned some lessons along the way. So thank you very much. Oh, no, patience and confidence are two things. And just and look, the last thing, and you'll hear every great businessman, sportsman say this, and I don't put myself in either category, trust me. But perseverance is key. And the fact you've been doing it for four years, you know, that, that's the hardest part, right? The next four years should be a lot easier, but I can promise you this, and I say this to a good mate of mine, Dom Harvey, who's on a similar journey to you guys, but he's sort of, that's his sole income. He's got a thing called the Ronners Only podcast, which goes all right. And he gets frustrated at times that it's not where he wants it to be. But I keep saying, bro, what you guys, and this applies to you guys, what you're doing is quite incredible because you're in new media in an area that people don't quite know how to monetize it yet and they don't quite know. But the fact is you're still going, you're building your audience. I promise you that when you get to the end of this journey, you'll look back and go, those hard times were actually the good times. Because for whatever reason, and I think this affects women more than anyone, right? is that you forget how hard the hard times were. And the reason I say it affects women more than anyone, I was at the birth of Liam. I have never seen anything so hard or tough or, or, or woman or anyone have to go through the pain that they go through a childbirth. And yet, they'll have one and then they'll line up and have another and then they'll have another and another. And I can promise you, anything that blokes go through is nothing compared to the strength of character a woman has to endure to go through pregnancy and birth. So you learn along the way that, you know, toughness comes in many, many different forms. But perseverance is key. If you've got perseverance, you'll eventually get to where you want to get. And I saw something really interesting. I'm sure you guys have seen it as well. About a year ago, and it keeps popping up on social media, we've got these amazing actors. You had Robert De Niro and I think Al Pacino and Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks says, I wish somebody had told me when I was younger that uh, this too shall pass. Meaning... If you're in hard times, this too shall pass. If you're in amazing times and things are flying and people are blowing smoke up your ass, this too shall pass. The point being is that you're not always going to be in this state of negativity or positivity. Your life is an ebb and a flow of an up and a down, and you just got to try and take it all in the same stride, I think, because that will lead to a lot less stress and a lot less drama. And stress and drama is what no one wants in their life. I think that's a great place to end. Dean, thanks for your time. Pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, and don't forget, it's for gold. Zero <laughs> percent.